Hello everybody, good evening. I welcome to our Penang Story Lecture. And this time is for the promotion of Tamil on this island, Penang Muslim and Tamil vernacular public across the Bay of Bengal, 1880 to 1914 by Thorsten Chakhar. Correct? If I got your pronunciation right. All right, so we can call him Thorsten. So before we proceed, I would like to, um, before I, and also before I call upon our moderator, our, bon our moderator today is Dr. Dr. K. Anbalakan. He is a senior lecturer in history at the School of Humanities, University Science Malaysia. Um, he has a master degree in Indian political and constitutional history and a PhD in political science. His research area includes Indian nationalism, social, political, and economic history of Malaysia, identity construction among Malaysian Indians, and ethnic studies. Maybe he can tell you more about himself, and without any further ado, let's welcome our moderator. Thank you, Abel. A good welcome to all of you, and also thank you so much for attending, because usually, or seldom people go for this kind of, this kind of you know, <coughs> academic discourses. Abel said, you know, that I might be telling much about me. I'm not supposed to say anything about me because I'm supposed to introduce the speaker today, Dr. Thorsten, I have difficulty, you know, Sha uh, sorry. Because in Malaysia, you know, since our we are familiar with English names. We have difficulty in pronouncing, you know, German or even uh, Dutch names. We have difficulty. Yeah? <coughs> Please excuse me for that. Okay, this Penang story lecture on the 20th century Tamil press in Penang is being organized by, as you all know, Penang Heritage Trust, a non profiting sorry, non-profit and non-governmental organization established in 1986. It has been, you know, doing this since its inception. And uh, today, we are having uh, Dr. Thorsten here, who is a lecturer for Tamil language and culture at the Center of Modern Indian Studies, University of Göttingen, Germany. University of Göttingen is no ordinary university having been established you know, some 279 years, and way back in 1733. And it's a historic university because people like me, who are students of history, I wouldn't want to call that I'm a professional or practicing historian maybe, but student of history. We always you know, look up at universities like Gottingen because it is Gottingen University, you know, during its During the en enlightenment years, eh, enlightenment years, contributed so much to make history as an uh, intellectual and academic subject. In fact, it was Gottingen history which started teaching history, Gottingen University which started teaching history in the universities, and also, you know, emphasized more on uh, the importance of sources. Also, used, you know, science, em emeritic science, you know, to to validate sources, and they also introduce the seminar system to teach history, which later was well developed by Leopold von Ranke, also from German, also not from Göttingen uh, University. And today, throughout the world, <coughs> we are using that seminar system to teach history, and history also has been accepted as an intellectual and academic, you know discipline in all the universities. So the thing actually began in Gottingen University, and we are having Dr. Austin, so he should be a great person, because coming from Gottingen University is no ordinary university. And uh, today, the topic that uh, Dr. Austin is going to give us or deliver is Penang Muslims and Tamil vernacular publics across the Bay of Bengal. It's an effort to document the history and development of Tamil publishing in Penang and the role played by the Tamil publishing in the Strait Settlements. So without wasting much time, I invite Dr. Thorsten 
to deliver his findings. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Ann Badakhan, for this very nice introduction. And can everyone hear me? It sounds a little bit strange to me. Is that OK? Yeah, OK. And many thanks to the Penang Heritage Trust for inviting me to, for this opportunity to speak today. And um, I have really enjoyed the few days we have spent in Penang up to now. So I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity. Now, I should mention that um, up to now, most of my research has been on Singapore. And uh, I was very, very grateful for this opportunity to really look at what I had regarding Penang and compare it with what I already had seen in Singapore. And I was surprised that in a number of cases, the developments are really similar. But there are also a number of points where Penang is different. And um, while I won't be able tonight to give you easy answers of why that is, um, it is still a very interesting thing to look at. Now, before I start the talk, I should maybe clarify some terms a little bit. And the most important terms is the term is what do I mean when I speak about a vernacular public? By vernacular publics, I mean two things which usually came together. One, these are publics which were formed outside the immediate colonial elites. It doesn't mean that these were not elite people themselves, but it is yet a group of people who were not usually either at the center of power or the direct center of power, um, or who somehow communicated, at least with a part of the population that was somewhat removed for, uh, from the center of power. And the other important thing about these publics is that these were publics where people usually utilized Asian languages for debate. Why should we study such vernacular publics? Um, the most important thing is that it gives us a chance to shift our focus from the colonial gaze and from the concerns that colonial society had, um, the kind of ideas, the kind of uh, debates that occurred among the English-speaking colonial elites. And come closer a little bit to the concerns of the, large, the larger part of the population, namely the different people from Asia, whether they be Indians, Chinese, Malays, who lived in Penang, and get a little bit more about the concerns, about the dreams, the fears, the opinions of them into the picture. At the same time, we should still remember that the sources we look at when we look at these kind of vernacular publics are still sources produced by people who were in one way or the other elites. You needed to be elite to found a newspaper, to write, to have the power to make your opinion somehow heard, even if this was outside the charmed circles of uh, the colonial government or uh, European uh, settlers, nevertheless, these were still, by and large, elites within their respective societies. So one can't really say that this is any form of subaltern history, but I think, nevertheless, it, is, it provides us with different viewpoints and with very different sort of connections that um, may give us fresh food for thought and uh, may lead us to ask different kind of questions from what we have done in the past. So let me start by asking what are actually the sources for such vernacular publics? The first thing that historians usually tend to look at are the documents left behind by governments. Now, in these documents, we do indeed occasionally get references to vernacular publics, usually when the government became concerned about it. That is, when people um, 
met in public and the government sensed that there might be some danger for revolt or for disturbance of peace. Um, these were the, or, or when, for example, uh, the government tried to uh, control the production of newspapers, what were newspapers printing, who owned printing presses, who had the capacity to print. In those cases, we do get references, even within the colonial archive, the government archive, to different forms of vernacular publics. And there has also been vernacular communication with the government. When we actually look at our uh, government records, we do find petitions, we do find letters sent by people to the government, um, often in the different uh, languages that they used. So, for example, this is a document from Singapore. Unfortunately, you can't see the uh, uh, line at the bottom. It's a Tamil petition from Singapore from the 23rd of October, 19, uh, 1865, uh, made in connection with an event um, that o had occurred a year earlier and which was to foreshadow events in Penang, namely a riot that had taken place in Singapore during the Muharram processions between two secret societies, the white flags and the red flags. And that is, of course, something which is also very important for Penang history. So in this context, we do find documents such as these. At the same time, what I'm going to talk about today are not these government documentations, but rather printed material. This is especially newspapers, sometimes using English, but mostly newspapers, in my case, produced in Tamil as well as simple books, the products of the print market, literary as well as non-literary. For example, what you see here uh, is the first page of the first collection of Tamil poetry printed in Penang, at least the first one that is extant. If there was an earlier one, um, I'm not aware of it. I will talk a little bit about this particular collection later. There is also a third type of evidence that we can use, which again in this talk I will um, by and large neglect, but which is also very important when we actually speak about public, public sphere, people interacting in public. And this is physical and visual evidence. These are, for example, buildings, buildings which were meant to be representative, which had facades that were meant to convey something to the people who passed these buildings day by day. And one example for that um, we can see in the Kapitan Kling Mosque, one of the most important monuments of Penang. Until the early 20th century, this is how the mosque looked. And I have to thank uh, Salma for supplying me with that picture. Now, if you compare the architecture of this building with the architecture of the building that came up in its wake, you see that they're quite different. This building looks very much like a mosque founded by South Indians throughout Southeast Asia in the 19th century. You go to Malacca, you find similar buildings. You go to Singapore, you still have the Masjid Jamai Chulia, which has a sort of similar architecture, though not as grand. And what you see now, when you see, uh, look at the Masjid Kapitan Kling, you see a building in a sort of Mughal empire-like style. And the interesting thing is that in the early 20th century, these buildings, mos uh, mosque architecture in Malaya, came up with this type of style, which was very closely connected to what has been called Indo-Saracenic style. It's something that the British had adopted as a sort of imperial style. And in some cases, uh, it may indeed be, as uh, Salma has suggested for the Kapitan Kling Mosque, that these buildings were when, when new mosques were built, really adopted this style in a sort of, under a sort of influence from the government itself. But the curious thing is that you actually also find places where the Muslim community itself decided that they wanted a mosque that looked more like the imperial style. And uh, again, I will refer to Singapore for that. One is the Sultan Mosque in Singapore, which was built deliberately as a mosque for all the Muslims in Singapore, and where one for some reason or the other, the people chose a sort of Mughal uh, influence style. But the more interesting thing, which very few people know, is that this Masjid Jamai Chulia in Singapore, which has, to this day, a more South Indian and Southeast Asian looking style, there was a movement at some point, 
there were plans to renovate that mosque and give it a completely different uh, appearance. And these documents still exist. We, we still have the plans. The plans were drawn. And they would have looked very much like Indo-Saracenic architecture if the community would have had the money to carry them out. So this was something that um, people tried to project certain images in public. And this changed over time. And it's a very interesting question of why certain ways, certain images were chosen at certain times. And this is not only true for buildings. We can look at photographs. We can look at, I mean, photographs, for example, family photographs. How did people dress in these photographs, etc. We can look at all sorts of other material objects. And we can look at the printed material that I'm going to speak about today itself, because that also has design. It has layouts. Uh, and you will see some of that uh, later on, and we can maybe discuss a little bit about that as well. Now, the last thing I need to explain to you is why did I choose this period between 1880 and 1914 in particular. The beginning point is that the beginnings of Tamil print in the Strait settlements lie in the early 1970s. The earliest publication for Penang that I know about is in the early 1880s. And the big problem is that even though we know of a lot of publications by name, we don't have the publications extant anymore. Um, I shall talk a little bit later about uh, the economy of print and why that is that we don't really have some of these copies left. Actually, it is more surprising that we do have quite a lot of sources. And this is due to a law published uh, a law made in 1886 and uh, which um, took effect from 1st of January 1887 known as the Book Registration Ordinance. This was an ordinance that was made by the British exactly why, because they realized that vernacular publishing in the Strait Settlements was going up. And in the debates in the legal assembly, it, it sounds all very benevolent. You say, oh, we have to preserve these things for the future. But you can also guess that there was a surveillance aspect involved in this, that people wanted, the, the government really wanted to know also what was published. To register books was already a common practice by that time in India, and the government in the state settlements adopted a similar approach of book registration, which uh, gives us a very interesting record of books published in the state settlements in all sorts of languages way until the Second World War. Now, part of that ordinance was that three copies of every publication in the Strait Settlements had to be submitted to the government. And that meant if you registered a newspaper, you only had to register the newspaper once, but of every issue of the newspaper, three copies had to go to the government. And of these, one copy was to be sent to the British Museum in London. The result is, if you want to find documents for the history of Penang, at least printed documents, the British Library is still probably the best repository. The other two copies were to be um, distributed to libraries in the Strait Settlements. It didn't specify which these were supposed to be, but again, we have quite a lot also of Penang material in Singapore, so um, this was probably one institution that uh, received the second copy. Where the third copy went, I'm not quite sure. But thanks to that law, from 1887 onwards, we usually have a very good record of newspapers, of uh, printed books, etc. Everything that is before 1887, whatever it is, if it is in Chinese, in Malay, or in Tamil, chances that it survived are very, very dim. And that something survived still are actually uh, a miraculous thing in a sense. Now, in all of this period, between 1880 and 1914, the role of Muslims in Tamil publishing is very, very strikingly visible. And it is striking for somebody who studies Tamil, the development of Tamil literature, and especially of Tamil printing. Because when you look at India, Tamil printing in India, which was, of course, the center at that time and still till today, of Tamil printing, as well as Tamil printing in Sri Lanka, Muslims have hardly played a comparable role there in the establishment of printing presses, in 
publishing books, publishing newspapers. This is not to say that they haven't done anything like that, but nevertheless, for example, in India, it was, was far more common for Muslims to go to a Hindu-owned or Christian-owned printing press and have their books pub uh, printed there. In the straight settlements, we see a tremendous involvement of Muslims in this print process, and you will see some of this, this in the talk. And that, is, that goes roughly up to the First World War. Again, a little bit later, I will talk to you about why that is so. And so this, is, this explains this window of 1880 to 1914. So let me give you some sort of statistics a little bit about Tamil printing in Penang in that period. As I've already mentioned, probably the beginnings of the Tamil press in Penang lie in the 1880s. The first uh, publication we know about was a newspaper, which I am also going to talk about a little bit later, called Vidya Vicharini. And that was published in 1883. We don't know the exact dates when it was published, but 1883 we can be sure about for a reason uh, that a little bit of that newspaper is preserved. Not the newspaper itself, but some of its publications were reprinted in another newspaper. And um, that, from that we can tell roughly that in 1883, in March, April, May, early 1883, this newspaper was in existence. Now, then, as I already mentioned, from 1887 onwards, the Book Registration Ordinance allows for a better assessment of Tamil printing. So, between 1887 and 1914, 34 Tamil publications were registered in the Strait Settlements. Um, this may not seem like a particularly large number. If you compare it, though, with the number of Chinese publications in the same period from the Strait Settlements, it is actually roughly comparable. Now, of these 34 registered Tamil publications, nine, about a quarter, were registered in Penang. But you always have to know, uh, keep in mind that the British were not all knowing, and there were publications that were simply never registered. Among them, one of the most important Tamil newspapers in Penang. It is not found in the catalogues of registration, despite the fact that it appears in the blue books, so the British knew about it. But for some reason, it was overlooked to be registered, even though all the copies are there as well. So it seems it probably was registered, but maybe the registrar simply failed to fill in his documents, clearly. Whatever it may be, there are actually more publications than uh, these numbers suggest. The other thing that we have to keep in mind or the second thing is that this figure of Tamil publications only registers the monolingual Tamil publications. There were actually also in the Strait Settlements many, many multilingual publications. And there were in that same period registered eight multilingual publications with Tamil as one part. And of these, more than half were registered in Penang, which is a, a, also a very interesting thing. Uh, to think about. The third thing that we should keep in mind when we talk about these relatively low numbers is that despite these low numbers, many of these um, registered publications were newspapers. And as I said, a newspaper was registered usually only once. And then it published and published and published and published. So you have one registered publication which may have uh, a registered publication, which may have uh, thousands of pages, actually, because with every issue of the newspaper, pages were added. So the numbers are a little bit misleading in this context. I should talk a little bit about the end of this period, about the effects of World War I, because, of course, you could guess 1914 somehow has to do with World War I. And the reason why I stop at this point uh, in my discussion has to do with this war. One of the most important things that happened with the beginnings of World War I was that there was pretty immediately a shortage of paper. And since the government controlled paper distribution, you can imagine uh, which newspapers got the first shot at good paper. And you can also perhaps imagine how it looked for vernacular newspapers. Some of the newspapers published early in the First World War uh, are printed on extremely bad paper, school exercise books, etc., etc. 
and uh, most of the newspaper editors had to cut down the number of pages in their publications and thereby often also had to cut down on things like advertisements, uh, notices for which they actually received revenue. So they made quite huge losses through that shortage of paper. At the same time, many people smelled business here. War had broken out, everyone wanted to have news. So in late 1914, while the amount of paper goes down, at the same time, the number of newspapers that were registered in Penang and Singapore shoots up. So quite a lot of people got the idea, I can make quick money here. The result was that the, the, the already short amount of paper got even curtailed more. And as a result, many, many vernacular publications had to cease publication. Even if they had been quite successful before the First World War, they had to cease publication in 1914. And what continues during the First World War is mostly vernacular publications run by English language newspapers, who then decided we make a Malay edition, we make a Tamil edition, because they had the access to the paper. The last aspect, of course, of World War I is that uh, Censorship comes into play, and I shall talk a little bit more about that towards the end. So, let us talk a little bit about the role of South Indian Muslims and publics in Penang. South Indian Muslims have played a very important role in Penang publics since the foundation of Georgetown, and this is something that you can see in the built environment of Georgetown. You can see it through the buildings, not least the Kapitan Kling Mosque, you can see it through the construction of buildings such as schools, graveyards, karamats, etc. They also played a role in public through their, their involvement in the red and uh, white flag societies. Now, even though these are always dubbed secret societies, they were at pretty public um, events and pretty public actions such as Muharram processions. So, all through the 19th century, we find South Indian Muslims very strongly involved uh, in public activities in Penang. But as I have mentioned, the most important part really has been their impact on print culture. They really were the first newspaper entrepreneurs in the Strait Settlements among the Tamil-speaking community. So out of nine Penang Tamil newspapers, seven were founded, th that were founded before 1914, seven were founded by Muslims and largely had Muslim editors. All the literary works in Tamil published in Penang before 1914 were composed by Muslims. Later on, uh, after the First World War, we find quite a lot of religious Hindu poetry. But before the First World War, all the books that I've been able to find were written by Muslims. One thing, though, that struck me, and this is one of the differences which I sort of sense between Penang and Singapore, is that I find comparatively little involvement in setting up Tamil printing presses. We can talk about this later. I will give also a few examples. But this is one of the things that struck me because I had expected it to be otherwise. Now, this importance of the Muslim community was noted by the um, the Tamil community at large. So on 20th of February 1888, uh, a newspaper called Hindu Nesan, which was really the first non-Muslim run Tamil newspaper in Penang, published a short article entitled Mohammedans, speaking especially of the South Indian Mohammedans, and I quote, the members of this community who are very excellent in the path of religion, are alert in trade without deviating a little from the established practice of lineage and religion. To whichever country they journey with determination and gain money, faith and unity prosper much among them in a special manner. They have gained renown as innumerable scholars and authors, standing in the tradition of those desirous of education and suitable knowledge. And I think here's a printing mistake. One can also interpret this line a little bit different, but it doesn't really make much of a difference. Even though they pay particular attention to the Arabic language, they have taken countless efforts to create and promote Tamil books also in the Tamil language. Now, there's one little note which I have to make when I speak about South Indian Muslims in Penang, and this involves the community which is often called Jawi Peranakan. Now, from the perspective of the colonial government, Jawi Peranakan were people 
whose usually fathers were Indian Muslims and whose mothers were Malays, but who, due to this particular setup, generally tended towards the Malay community. And in the census records, the Jawi Peranakan were always counted as Malays. Now, the interesting thing is, I have looked through, I don't know how many hundreds or even thousands of pages of newspapers for that period in Tamil. And the only time I found the term Jawi Peranakan used was in an obituary for the editor of a newspaper that was called Jawi Peranakan, a very important Malay newspaper published in Singapore by an editor from Penang. Um, and when he passed away, a Tamil newspaper published an obituary. And that is the only mention of the term I've ever found. You find all sorts of lists of the races and people that inhabit the Strait Settlements. Long lists with all imaginable sorts of communities. And practically